even when he's manifesting a, a body of a young age, huh, still he has the potency and can perform all of the pastimes of any age. See, that's how Krishna killed so many demons, even when he was just a little baby. Putana, you know, Shankachuda, so many other devotees, uh, so many other demons were killed by Krishna. Well, he was still a baby. So if he can kill demons when he's a baby, then certainly he can dance with the gopis when he's five years old. See, he simply manifests a suitable form at, at the time when it's appropriate. And then afterwards, he again becomes a, a young boy, and he comes back home and is like, Mommy, you know. <laughs> Where were you? I got lost in the woods. Right? Oh, okay, come on. Well, what are those scratches? <laughs> so, uh, Krishna is such a rascal. He is the supreme rascal. <laughs> but when Krishna is a rascal, it's delightful and wonderful and transcendental. Uh, then when, we're, we're ras when we are rascals, then it's, it's not so nice. So Krishna was beautiful because every part of his body was perfectly arranged without any defect. Such perfect bodily features of Krishna are described as follows. My dear enemy of Kangsa, your broad eyes, your rising chest, your two pillar-like arms, and the thin middle portion of your body are always enchanting to every lotus-eyed beautiful girl. The ornaments on the body of Krishna were not actually enhancing his beauty, but just the reverse. The ornaments were beautified by Krishna. A person is called mild when he cannot even bear the touch of the most soft thing. It is described that every part of Krishna's body was so soft that even at the touch of newly grown leaves, the color of the touched part of his skin would change. At this Kaishora age, Krishna's endeavors were always bent toward arranging the rasa dance, as well as toward killing the demons in the forest of Vrindavan. While Krishna was engaged in enjoyment with the boys and girls within the forest of Vrindavan, Kangsa used to send his associates to kill Krishna, and Krishna would show his prowess by killing. So we're going to end here and ask for questions. If, if, if nobody asks a question after all that, well, then, you know, you might as well check yourself into the hospital. <laughs> Huh? Call the ambulance quick. <laughs> what? Uh oh. Somebody using the phone? Oh, yeah, the phone rang earlier. Hmm. Hmm? Okay. Are there any questions out there in Internet land? I can't believe there's no questions. I mean, that's just like the most outrageous stuff that you can find anywhere in the world. And uh, I mean, there's got to be some questions. OK. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we are, uh, when we are in this learning process uh, and the neophyte stage and going through the higher stages, we are 
we study many pastimes of Krishna and like that in which we we feel attracted to some more than others and like this and then uh, for example today I was reading a website which had like many many devotional songs uh, and I was reading some of the songs by Rupa Goswami oh, which are very elevated yeah. and uh, I was reading uh, well, I, I don't. I don't think it's important to go into details. the The point is, many of these pastimes are so elevated that uh, Prabhupada explains that we should always understand the most intimate pastimes of Radha Krishna in, by the eyes of the six Goswamis, by their scriptures. It seems to me that. Uh, even doing that is kind of it's like very complicated because in the pastimes in, in intimate pastimes the, the interactions between the gopis and Krishna and uh, the way they speak and like that is always with an edge and with so much artistic uh, items in between those words that it makes it very very hard to to understand uh, uh, as it is, you know. So the question would be, uh, should we approach these uh, scriptures only later on in the stages of Baba and measure if they're valid or not in the sense of the, the translation might be bad or there's something wrong by how much ecstasy or Bhava it generates? How, how are we how are we supposed to make sure it's bona fide and we're not reading some cheesy translation full of mistakes well whether we're in the neophyte stage or in the advanced stage we should be careful to receive this transcendental knowledge from authorized sources and uh, of course, the, the transcendental pastimes of Krishna, especially these pastimes with the gopis, are so extremely elevated that uh, it's quite possible to mistranslate or misunderstand. In fact, it's more likely that we'll misunderstand than that we'll understand. Uh, because these pastimes are not like anything in this material world. Uh, they are... Uh, so transcendental and so ecstatic, so intense, so dramatic. Um, so we have to make sure that the people who we, uh, you know, whose translations that we read are reliable. Like we know that Srila Prabhupada is completely reliable. Anything that Srila Prabhupada translates is good. Uh, but uh, we don't know about others, and they may introduce some uh, distortion. But still, I mean, it's, it's actually very hard to completely ruin these scriptures, you know. I mean, you know, even I've seen bad translations, like when I was chanting in Hawaii, I had a translation of Ujwala Nilamani. Ujwala Nilamani is all about Krishna's pastimes with the gopis, all the different groups of gopis and all of their different qualities and the, the different relationship that they had with Krishna and the kind of pastimes that they engaged in with Krishna and all these very intimate descriptions of their relationships and activities. And it was from uh, some Gaudiya Math temple. And... Um, you know, there were a lot of misspelled words and typographical errors and printing mistakes. And I mean, it was a mess, you know, it was a typical Indian book. Now, now the quality of Indian books has improved a lot because of computer typesetting. But, uh, you know, especially back in the days when this book was produced, which is back in the 60s or 70s that it was printed, all the typesetting was done by hand. And often by people who didn't even read English. <laughs> so if you can imagine someone trying to typeset a book in a language that they don't read. 
<laughs> and the and the typesetting isn't done wasn't done by computer. The typesetting was done by hand by picking letters and and putting them in a in a row. You know, little pieces of lead type and putting them in a row. And to do this, you have to be able to read backwards in a language that you don't understand. So there were many many mistakes. But still, the flavor of those pastimes came through, even with all those problems, you know. Like the, the Nectar of Devotion itself that, that we're reading now has many editorial mistakes. And I'm sure as time goes on uh, that we'll find more and more and more of them. Because uh, maybe some of the devotees in my generation will become more advanced, advanced enough, you know, to translate Sanskrit properly. And we'll finally get a complete translation of the original text. This uh, version